Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we look at the latest guidance on PSA testing, as outlined in the PSA Consensus 2024, available through Prostate Cancer UK and also featured in the British Journal of General Practice. We'll also cover recommendations from Public Health England, some aspects of the NICE guidelines on prostate cancer, and the panel and on urology cancer referral pathways, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. You can find links to all of these in the episode description. If you'd like a refresher on the NICE guidance on managing male LATs, please refer to the corresponding episode on this channel. The link is also in the episode description. Right, let's jump into it. Although the PSA Consensus 2024 focuses on PSA testing in asymptomatic men, we'll also cover testing in symptomatic patients. So let's start with patients with symptoms. While many people with prostate cancer are asymptomatic, we should suspect prostate cancer if there are unexplained symptoms. Possible prostate cancer symptoms can be non-specific, such as anorexia or weight loss, lethargy or lower back or bone pain. But it could also be urological symptoms such as erectile dysfunction, hematuria or any lower urinary tract symptoms or LADs, including nocturia, urinary frequency, hesitancy, urgency or retention. Even though male LADs alone do not necessarily suggest prostate cancer or automatically warrant PSA testing, the NICE Cancer Guideline recommends checking PSA and performing digital rectal examination when these symptoms are present or whenever there is any suspicion of prostate cancer. We will make an urgent referral on the cancer pathway if a digital rectal examination reveals a suspicious prostate or PSA levels exceed age-specific thresholds. These thresholds are above 2.5 for those aged 40 to 49, above 3.5 for those aged 50 to 59, above 4.5 for those aged 60 to 69, and above 6.5 for those aged 70 to 79. For those aged under 40 or over 79, we will use our clinical judgment. In addition, the Pan-London Cancer Referral Pathway states that the raised PSA should be in the absence of a UTI or when the PSA levels remain elevated at least 8 weeks after a UTI has been treated. On the other hand, if the PSA exceeds 20 nanograms per milliliter, an urgent cancer referral can be made even if the UTI is present. Right, so we've covered what to do for symptomatic patients. Now let's look at the recommendations for PSA testing in asymptomatic patients. Currently in the UK, PSA testing is freely available to anyone aged 50 and over who requests it. This includes anyone with a prostate, including trans women and non-binary people. Patients who request the PSA test should receive balanced information on the pros and cons of testing. Public Health England recommends a patient information leaflet outlining the potential benefits and risks of PSA testing. A link to this leaflet is available in the episode description. However, Public Health England also advises that GPs should not proactively raise the topic of PSA testing with asymptomatic people. This is due to the potential harms of overdiagnosis and overtreatment of slow-growing prostate cancers, which are common and may not cause symptoms or shorten life expectancy. Additionally, PSA is not a perfect test. Although most patients have a PSA level below 3 nanograms per milliliter, around 75% of men with a PSA above this threshold do not have cancer. On the other hand, about 15% of men with a low PSA will later be found to have prostate cancer. PSA levels can also be elevated for various reasons other than prostate cancer, including UTIs, benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostatitis, as well as recent ejaculation or vigorous exercise. Therefore, before performing a PSA test, we should ensure that patients do not have a UTI or have had one within the last six weeks, that they have not ejaculated or engaged in vigorous exercise within the past 48 hours, 
or that they have not undergone any urological interventions in the past six weeks. Now that we've reviewed the current recommendations, let's look at the new guidance in the PSA Consensus 2024. This consensus was developed because current testing guidelines are based on an outdated diagnostic pathway, where a biopsy typically followed a raised PSA. The current pathways are more accurate using MRIs and thus reducing the risk of overtreatment. Moreover, existing guidelines do not offer clear advice for men who are at higher risk of prostate cancer. Another reason was to address potential health inequalities. While PSA tests are freely available through the NHS, GPs are instructed not to proactively raise the issue, meaning that the more health literate and affluent patients are more likely to request testing, leaving men in deprived areas with lower testing rates. Whilst the consensus still recommends that asymptomatic men should be provided with balanced information on PSA testing, and they should have access to it starting at age 50, in order to address all these concerns, it also recommends a more proactive approach for men who are at higher risk of prostate cancer, even though it does not go as far as recommending general screening. Therefore, the consensus states that we should proactively discuss prostate cancer risk and PSA testing with those at higher risk, which includes black men aged 45 and over, as black ethnicity alone confers a higher risk, men aged 45 and over with a family history of prostate cancer, and men with confirmed genetic risk factors such as the BRCA2 gene variation. The responsibility for raising awareness about prostate cancer in primary care lies with all trained healthcare professionals, not just GPs, and patients should still be provided with balanced information on PSA testing. There was no consensus on PSA threshold values for asymptomatic patients due to insufficient evidence for age-specific thresholds. Currently, the referral threshold for asymptomatic men is a PSA level of 3 nanograms per milliliter or higher. However, questions were raised regarding the rationale behind this threshold, especially for men aged 50 to 79. Let's remember that for symptomatic patients, NICE recommends different thresholds based on age. 3.5 for those in the 50s, 4.5 for those in the 60s, and 6.5 for those in the 70s. Concerns were raised that using the lower threshold of 3 in asymptomatic patients could lead to overtreatment. However, since no alternative thresholds were agreed upon, we will have to use our clinical judgment in order to decide whether to investigate, further or refer. Also, while digital rectal examination is still valuable in symptomatic patients, there is uncertainty over its usefulness in asymptomatic people. So, if a referral is needed because of a high PSA, a digital rectal examination prior to referral was not strictly necessary, especially as evidence suggests that digital rectal examination can act as a barrier for some men seeking help. This is also the case in patients with normal PSA levels, even when risk factors like family history or black ethnicity are present. The low positive predictive value of digital rectal examination and inconsistent results between primary and secondary care were cited as concerns. However, if a digital rectal examination is performed and the findings are suspicious, referrals should then be made even with a low PSA. There was no agreement on whether digital rectal examination prior to testing increases PSA levels, so its impact on PSA results remain uncertain. The frequency of repeat PSA testing should be based on individual risk factors. There was no consensus on specific intervals for repeat testing due to insufficient evidence and concerns about the burden on primary care. However, it's likely that PSA testing will be required at least annually potentially more often for high-risk patients or those with fluctuating PSA levels. There's also a role for the use of PSA velocity in determining whether to refer to secondary care, but again, no specific guidance was given about this. What is PSA velocity? P 
PSA velocity refers to how quickly the PSA increases over time. A rapid increase in PSA, even if the total PSA level is not very high, can be an indicator of underlying prostate issue. A PSA velocity of more than 0.75 nanograms per milliliter per year has been used as a threshold in some clinical settings to prompt further investigations. So, although PSA velocity is not officially incorporated into NICE guidance for asymptomatic patients, it can still be considered if there are concerns. Always taking into account that PSA velocity has limitations, so it should always be interpreted in the context of the overall clinical picture. Although there was no consensus on broader screening for asymptomatic patients due to the risk of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, there is agreement on the following points. The PSA blood test is the first step in the prostate cancer diagnostic pathway, identifying men who may benefit from further testing, typically an MRI scan. And the balance of benefits and harms is shifting in favour of screening, but further research is still needed. In summary, current guidelines recommend that GPs do not proactively raise the issue of PSA testing with asymptomatic patients. However, the PSA Consensus 2024 challenges this, advising primary care professionals to have proactive discussions with men aged 45 and over who are at higher than average risk, including those of black ethnicity, with a family history of prostate cancer or with genetic risk factors. However, it did not recommend proactive conversations for all at-risk men, that is, all those aged 50 or over, without other risk factors. This consensus reflects changes in policy in other countries. For example, EU member states are considering stepwise implementation of organised prostate cancer screening, and the US expert panel recently recommended annual PSA screening for black men starting at the age of 40. This shift is likely to prompt a review of UK guidelines in the near future. And that is it, a review of PSA testing for early prostate cancer detection in primary care. As always, remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.